This video is sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the best way to carve out a space of your own online. Whether you're just starting out or managing an existing brand, Squarespace provides everything you need to create a beautiful website to engage with your audience, sell products, host content, and much more. With Squarespace, you don't need to be an expert at writing code. Simply select from dozens of pre-made flexible templates. Once you've found one to your liking, Squarespace's fluid engine allows you to customize your site as much or as little as you want. These are the tools I've been using to build a website for my production company, Galaxy Class Pictures. Adding images, text and video, as well as integrating merch, no problem. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. For the longest time, Frank Herbert's epic science fiction novel Dune was said to be unfilmable, but that didn't stop many filmmakers from trying. After many failed attempts, in 1984 a big screen version did finally materialise in the form of the David Lynch directed and Dino De Laurentiis produced Dune. Despite eventually accruing a cult fanbase, Dune was met with poor reviews and box office failure. A sincere attempt, but a swing and a miss. Though that didn't mean the dream of one day seeing the Dune universe brought to the screen was dead forever. Dune would simply have to move to a smaller screen. In the fallout of Dune 1984's failure at the box office, the film rights reverted back to the Frank Herbert estate, and hope for more Dune movies was seemingly dead in the water. However, by the following decade, executive producer Richard P. Rubenstein believed he had the answer. Rubenstein had tremendous success in the mid-90s, adapting the Stephen King novels The Stand and The Langoliers into hit television miniseries, and thought that perhaps Dune could see similar success in the format. He said, I have found there's a wonderful marriage to be had between long, complicated books and the television miniseries. There are some books that just can't be squeezed into a two-hour movie. Rubenstein's vision for a Dune miniseries aligned well with Sci-Fi Channel president Bonnie Hammer's ethos for the cable channel. For most of its early history, the Sci-Fi Channel licensed other shows and movies as opposed to making their own, airing reruns of Doctor Who and Star Trek. But by the mid-90s, Bonnie Hammer wanted to create original sci-fi programming, putting the channel on the map with blockbuster miniseries. It was this ethos which eventually led to the production of Steven Spielberg's Taken and the reimagined Battlestar Galactica. However, the Sci-Fi Channel's first miniseries was to be Frank Herbert's Dune. After the project was greenlit in November 1999, Rubenstein hired John Harrison, who had previously directed Tales from the Dark Side the movie, which Rubenstein had produced, to both write and direct the Dune miniseries. Harrison was a massive fan of the book, and sought to create a more faithful adaptation than the 84 version. That being said, Harrison did make some changes. Like the 84 version, Harrison chose to age up Paul Atreides to a young adult, rather than the 15-year-old he is in the books. The weirding way was also altered from martial art to include a super speed element. Harrison also chose to add a subplot of Princess Irulan investigating the fall of House Atreides, among other things. As with many big miniseries productions at the time, the project needed a star name to attract audience interest. Eventually, they offered the role of Duke Leto Atreides to William Hurt. As it turned out, Hurt was a big science fiction fan and a Dune aficionado, and so he gladly accepted the part. As the production would be based in the Czech Republic, the rest of the cast were either British or European. Scottish actor Alec Newman won the role of Paul Atreides. Newman would later re-team with Hurt for another miniseries based on Frankenstein, and would make another foray into science fiction, appearing in Star Trek Enterprise. Playing Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, was English actress Saskia Reeves. Another Scottish actor, James Watson, was cast as the Atreides swordmaster, Duncan Idaho. Other British cast members included Ian McNeese, who would later appear as Winston Churchill in Doctor Who, as the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. P.H. Moriarty as Gurney Halleck, Julie Cox as Princess Irulan, and Robert Russell as Dr. Yue. 
American actor Matt Kiesler was cast as the Baron's nephew, Fade, but Kiesler chose to affect a more transatlantic accent to more convincingly be related to McNeese's Baron. Most of the remaining cast members were local Czech actors. This included Barbara Kodatova as Shani, Karl Dobry as Liet Kynes, Laszlo Kish as Raban, Jan Vlask as Thufir Howard, Jan Unger as Piter, and Zuzana Gislerova as Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayam. Other international cast members included Italian actor Giancarlo Giannini as Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, and German actor Uwe Ochsenecht as Stilgar. When it came to filming the series, the production initially looked at desert locations all over the world, including Tunisia and Morocco. While these countries had hosted numerous Hollywood productions before, on-location conditions would make shooting there prohibitively expensive. It was acclaimed cinematographer Vittorio Storara who suggested shooting the miniseries entirely within a studio and creating the desert scenes using panoramic backdrops rather than green screens. It was a technique Storaro had used before on The Last Emperor and Dick Tracy, and so was confident it would work with Dune. John Harrison also saw it as an opportunity to create a desert location which literally couldn't be found anywhere on Earth. The series was shot in the Czech Republic at Prague's Barandov Studios, which had, and still has, the largest sound stages in Europe. Three enormous sets were constructed at the studios, depicting Getty Prime, Katan, and the city of Arakeen on Arrakis. The production design was handled by local Czech designer Milian Krejka Kliokovic. Much like the production design of the 84 film, Krejka wanted to give each world a distinct visual history. Arakeen was inspired largely by Moroccan architecture, Katan was given an Art Nouveau aesthetic, and Gidi Prime was a combination of German Expressionism and Brutalism, with bold reds and slanted angles. The costumes were designed by Theodore Pishtek, who had previously won an Academy Award for his work on Amadeus. Pishtek was initially uninterested in working on a science fiction project, until John Harrison described the project as being more Shakespeare than Star Trek. For research, Pishtek looked into the costume designs of Jean Girard aka Mobius, who originally worked on Jodorowsky's failed Dune adaptation. For the Fremen's blue eyes, actors were given contacts with a reflective coating which would glow bright blue when hit with an ultraviolet light. A full-scale ornithopter was built for the production, which doubled as every ornithopter seen in the series. It's very, very nippy in the desert, thank you very much. Plush leather interior, CD, everything that works. But there's no smoking, says the stewardess in said thopter. So these go. This thopter was then recreated digitally by Dune's in house visual effects team, led by VFX supervisor Ernie Farino. The VFX team used CGI to create various environments on Arrakis, as well as all of the planets, vehicles, and the giant sandworms. The music was composed by Graham Revel, known for his work on The Crow and The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. In contrast to the mix of synth, rock, and orchestra used in the 84 film, Revel went for a more acoustic score which utilised Middle Eastern drums and woodwinds. The orchestral elements of the score were performed by the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. After a massive year-long production, the three-part miniseries Frank Herbert's Dune was released on the Sci-Fi Channel in December 2000. Compared to the 1984 movie, it's fair to say the Dune miniseries is far less compromised than David Lynch's version. The observation that a work like Dune is far better suited to a miniseries than a single movie is very much on point, and when I sat down to rewatch the miniseries for this video, I was immediately impressed by the quality of the script and the production. Part 1 is, for the most part, fantastic as an adaptation of the source material and as a piece of drama. Unlike the 1984 movie, dazzling as it was, the Dune universe really lives and breathes better in the miniseries than it ever did in the movie. The sets and costumes look as though they've been lifted right from the pages of a Mobius art book, and the world building is woven into the dialogue and action beautifully. Important aspects of the Dune universe awkwardly whispered in jarring internal monologues in the 84 version are effortlessly communicated in this miniseries. The whole presentation of the thing takes on a theatrical quality with its bold lighting and classical staging. The Shakespearean court intrigue by way of sci-fi epic really comes to life on screen in rich detail. 
The majority of the cast are very strong, particularly Carl Dobry as Liet Kynes. His methodical line delivery and reserved expressions creates a great sense of mystery around the character, at first appearing as a possible villain before letting us get a peek at the idealistic visionary underneath the secretive demeanour. Honestly, he steals the show whenever he's on screen, even from heavy hitters like William Hurt. Alec Newman as Paul Atreides is a little more inconsistent. While the character has been aged up from the books, it seems as though Paul is still written to be an impulsive teenager. It's quite jarring to see this clearly adult man storming off in a huff like a spoiled child. One's fiercest competition comes from one's own kind. They look from the same bowl. That's not to say he's without charisma though, and his scene with Julie Cox's Princess Irulan is a real highlight of part one. The two of them fire off witty and insightful dialogue, demonstrating a spark of great chemistry between them. And later in the series, Newman excels as a powerful leader, exhibiting considerable gravitas and weight in his physicality and line delivery. Without the spice, the navigators will become blind. The Bene Gesserit will lose all powers. And all commerce among the great houses will cease. Civilization will end. If I am not obeyed, the spice will not flow. Not every casting choice is a bullseye, however. Although on paper the Baron is much closer to his depiction in the books, more of a conniving mastermind than the sadistic maniac seen in the Lynch film, Ian McNeese is, frankly, too nice a screen presence to really be great in the role. Not as repulsive as Kenneth Macmillan from the original film, but also not as intimidating as Stellan Skarsgård's portrayal in the 2021 version. The most strikingly missed cast character, however, is Gurney Halleck. There's not really a nice way of saying this, the performance is just terrible. Not in the mood. Mood is a thing for cattle and women, young pup. Mood is not for fighting. P.H. Moriarty simply isn't convincing in the role in any capacity. Whereas the rest of the cast nail that operatic tone the source material demands, Moriarty sticks out like a sore thumb. And unfortunately, while part one is very strong, parts two and three are where the miniseries really starts to struggle. For as much money as was spent on the series, the longer the characters spend in the desert, the cheaper the production starts to look. To borrow a gaming term, the fidelity of the series quickly breaks down. The painted backdrop of the desert may work for one or two close-up shots, but once one notices the same sand dunes and mountains repeated dozens of times, the viewer becomes keenly aware that this is a set in a studio and not the fantastical landscape of Arrakis. Because the rest of the show has such high production value, the moment the illusion of Dune's world breaks, it shatters. On more than one occasion, the camera is placed in the wrong position, completely giving away the desert as a large painting, and in numerous shots, the seams between the pictures which make up the backdrop are clearly visible. A sense of place is crucially important to the story of Dune, and unfortunately, this failure to achieve that sense of place ends up bringing the series down as a whole. In a way, the script for parts two and three are perhaps too faithful to the source material. There's an attempt to try and include basically everything from the novel. Coupled with the addition of a subplot following Irulan, this unfortunately makes parts two and three a real slog to get through. The desire to flesh out Irulan's character is an understandable one, but ultimately her plotline doesn't accomplish anything of note. She discovers information the viewer already knows, and her amenability to Paul is already well established in part one. And that excellent world building from part one ends up feeling like over clarification in parts two and three. In a strange way, the miniseries ends up running into the same problem as the 84 version. There's nothing left for the audience to intuit about this world or the story. Every element is rigorously explained in great detail for fear of leaving the viewer behind. Coupled with the limited amount of sets and the vast majority of the series ends up feeling like the same handful of conversations in the same handful of sets. It loses that epic quality part one was so successful in establishing. The narrative dragging its feet ends up hurting the climax of the series as well. The final battle, which should feel like a long-awaited payoff, ends up being too little too late. It doesn't help that the action in general is poorly captured and edited. The Harkonnen assault on House Atreides is literally only a minute long, and the rest of the skirmishes are let down by the obvious reuse of footage. This one warehouse is blown up repeatedly throughout the series. 
Thankfully, Paul's duel with Fade is more successful. The more complex choreography and clear coverage makes it a major improvement over the same scene from the 84 version. However, taken as a whole, the Dune miniseries is, in many ways, just as troubled as Lynch's film. Like that film, the miniseries is undeniably a work of passion by a team of people who deeply respected the source material. But whereas Lynch's film compromised on its creative vision to better fit popular trends, the miniseries has the opposite problem. It seeks to adapt the entirety of the novel in as much detail as possible, but in doing so the filmmakers seem to forget that what works on the page doesn't always work on the screen. The miniseries was actually my introduction to Dune, but it was the 1984 movie which got me to read the book. This just wasn't, and I'm afraid it still isn't, a version of Dune which I can connect with. Though I'm happy to know the same isn't true for everyone. Upon release, Frank Herbert's Dune became one of the Sci-Fi Channel's highest rated programs, bringing in over 4 million viewers for all three parts. The series was also generally well received by critics and audiences. While it was not universally praised, it was deemed a superior adaptation to the 1984 version. Like that version, the miniseries introduced a whole new generation to the Dune saga, many of whom still see this as the definitive adaptation. The Sci-Fi Channel's expensive gamble on Dune seemed to have worked, and unlike the 84 version, the Dune saga in this form would continue. The saga of Dune is far from over. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share to stay up to date on all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, jump over to my Patreon where you can see videos early, uncut, and ad-free. Speaking of which, I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons and members now appearing on screen, with an ultra thanks to... Stacked, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Will Martin, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Caging G. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.